the distinction for between remote and distributed comes for me for two places. One, my engineering background, right, <laughs> so right. like a lot of study of distributed systems and how to make them resilient. But two, just the importance of words, which I think are, you know, words create reality. And even the word remote and distributed, like if you're remote, it implies that there's something essential that you're far away from. And work is so much about connection. You want to be close to your colleagues. You want to be connected. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be remote from them. Hello, and welcome to Design Adjacent, the podcast that talks about the nexus of design both today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Vinny F. Johnson, and today our guest is an innovator, entrepreneur, champion, coder, and blogger. I am pleased to welcome to Design Adjacent none other than Matt Mullenweg, founding developer of WordPress, the open source software used by more than 40% of the web today. WordPress is a part of who Matt is. It's not something that he cannot work on WordPress. It's a part of who he is. The company has celebrated almost 20 years. The project touches a ton of people, and that's an understatement. He considers himself very lucky to be able to work on a project of this nature and something he loves so much. Matt is the CEO of Automatic, which is now a force behind WordPress.com, Jetpack, WooCommerce, and other products, including Tumblr. The company's mission is simply and powerfully to make the web a better place. Matt, welcome to De Design Adjacent. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's really incredible when we think about, looking back almost 20 years, the sheer impact that WordPress has had. So anyone who's listening to us, if you take 10 sites, at least four of them are built on WordPress. When you started, did you believe that you could have that potential reach with this wonderful idea of an open source way to build the web? Now, I think like many projects, it started with kind of a scratch your own itch. Right. Where it was very much, I was using other blogging software, none of it really fit. And so myself and a few other like-minded individuals, including the co-founder of WordPress, Mike Little, they yeah, started just hacking on something we thought would fit better. And that has continued now, I think, far beyond where any of us would have ever imagined. But the nice thing is it gets renewed. Right. So every time that I, I go to a WordPress event or hear a story from someone or someone tweets at me or writes an email, it really reminds me and takes me back to those very first days of like, oh, we're just trying to make something that at least one person finds useful. I remember the, the first time we connected and that the first thing I could simply say to you was just, thank you. As a young marketing director and working for community projects or small startups, you know, I remember kind of rolling my sleeves up and using WordPress and the themes to take us from zero to 60 in ways that small startups couldn't imagine or community art projects couldn't imagine. And you went from not having a web presence to having something that was respectable credible and impactful. And I share that as a part of my career journey. I can actively remember those times using WordPress and, and getting excited when I found other themes or working with developers to bring it forward. So, but I want to go back a little further than just the start of WordPress. I'm going to take you back to Houston, <laughs> where you're born and raised and talk a bit about Matt in high school. I saw that you attended the Houston School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. What was the goal then? What was the vision for life? Oh, I really thought I was going to go into music. Okay. At least if not as a full-time job, but then as a, a night gig. A lot right. of jazz musicians don't <laughs> often had other things to support themselves. But yeah, I was very lucky to be introduced to saxophone at a relatively young age. Okay. Houston had incredible both public schools. I went to all public schools, including the art school, and just really great, like, teachers and music education. So actually a, a few years ago, I started, I just kind of went back and thought of all the teachers that have been most influential to me. And I okay. added them to the about page of my website. So ma.tt slash about. And interesting, most of them ended up being my music teachers that wow. had kind of the impacts that I can still remember today. So yeah. kind of from third grade to through high school, you know, every day I'd have a couple hours. It's really kind of a testament when we see the success that you've had, but to kind of have that link back to the teachers who helped you along the way and helped you think about your approach to the world. 
So, you know, you move out of the School of the Performing Arts, right? Which sometimes seems like an unlikely path, but makes a lot of sense when you kind of think about what you did next. So from School of Performing Arts, University of Houston, right? Yeah. I think the other nice thing is those teachers were also my first clients and customers. Okay. So All right. they would universally that. believe in me and have right. pay me to build a computer for them or a website for them. I mean, far beyond what I was qualified to do at the time. So I remember I had this teacher named Doc Morgan. He was also part of University of North Texas. Okay. And he, he had me build their alumni website or... My uncle worked for another high school, St. Thomas, as a marketing director. And he was like, can you redo the St. Thomas website? And so I got like some really great opportunities to build things from these same teachers. And yeah, it it was one of those things where what you love and what you end up being really good at or maybe different. So I was okay at music. I wasn't at the very top of the class or anything like that. But I was just, I ended up uh, progressing really quickly, getting pretty good at the tech stuff at a relatively young age. So part of why I went to University of Houston was to just stay local, stay close okay. to family. And uh, my father had went there many years before. But at the time, it already felt like I was able to kind of support myself through right. building websites and computers. And, and that was really my passion. And then if I stayed local, I had a lot of gigs. So I played some big band gigs and some private gigs. And so I just want to stay in that community. And I was kind of going to college as a check the box thing, not really... Okay you know, studying computer science. I didn't study any computer courses in college. So it was, it was a time that I wish I could return to because it's such a luxury to be able to focus on learning as your full-time job or what should have been my full-time job. When did you feel like you had the breakthrough that you had found this space that you were passionate about and your skill sets and expertise were catching up with that passion? When did you feel like you had that moment? Yeah, there's definitely when I was able to pay rent on my own, which was a big one. And luckily in, in Houston, being ramen profitable was pretty low. I think my rent was only $425, which was nice. <laughs> but probably my breakthrough was uh, this event I went to called South by Southwest, which was okay. held in Austin. And there was a designer I was following named Jeffrey Zeldman, hmm. who was a big advocate of web standards, also just did some of the coolest design stuff I had seen online. So he was kind of one of the first, like, both designers, but educators, I right. called. You know, he, he really shared as he learned, which, you know, through his blog, which allowed me to follow on the journey with him. And he posted he was going to be in Austin. And at this conference, I'd never heard of, but my sister lived in Austin. So I had a yeah. place to stay and uh, they had student tickets. So I was able to get like a, a really inexpensive ticket. I was probably 18. It was, I think even before WordPress started. And going to that conference blew my mind. The interactive part or the, you know, computer part of South by Southwest at the time was probably just four or 500 people. It was pretty small. Okay. And so just in the hallways, it's like the internet became real. All these people who I followed online, usually their right. website blogs, you know, a lot of designers too, Jeffrey Zeldman, Derek Pozek, Kwasik, who else? Eric Meyer, Tantek Chelik. Like a lot of people who were building the web at the time were all there in person. <laughs> okay. And they're all really friendly. So they'd like, even though I was a kid that no one had ever heard of, like they would talk to me and I ended up at dinner with some of them and we talk in the halls and I follow them around. One of them tried to sneak me into an after party that I wasn't old enough to get into because I wasn't yet 21. So they were really, really friendly and nice. And so that I felt like I kind of met my trap. In Houston, okay. I had a few people, right? Uh, other super nerds like me that were part of the Linux user group and the Wi-Fi user group, the Palm Pilot group and the website group. And we all right. we get together like once a month, but it was probably like 30 or 40 of us. And here... It was 10 times that. And then I got the sense of San Francisco, which was like the Mecca where everyone right. was. So. so you come to this conference, you go in and you're transformed. Then what next? I go back to Houston. Okay. You know, do my bare minimum in college to get by and then just continue kind of spending. My real education was coming online, you know, through okay. books and following the blogs of some of the people I mentioned. And that was what led me to, to both developing software more as I want to customize websites more and more right. or develop sort of content management to manage larger websites. And then that led me and blogging myself, which I started with LiveJournal, then Movable Type, then B2. And then B2 was, of course, what WordPress was based on. Right. So a lot of it was just what I was doing and building myself. Building I'm very client driven and very personally driven. Building the self in the moment. So. You know, we skip ahead and we talk about kind of the, the presence of WordPress from over 40% of 
the web today. And it's based on that. One of the things that that strikes me in, in our conversations and in looking at, at what you're exploring today is this simple notion of pushing to make the web better, more open, and more diverse. And it, it seems like if you're just looking at your career journey, thing, that's been a throughput all the way through from the early blog conversations to WordPress to even the work you're doing now through Tumblr, making the web a better, more open space. It's something that I think about a lot and we've encouraged designers to think about a lot. What thoughts do you have for how the design enable community can help to build this promise of a better, more open, more diverse web? I think what really shaped me was mm-hmm. the generosity of the communities I was part of, the music right. and jazz community in Houston, the tech community that I joined, my teachers. And so it just always, it's made it a really strong part of my worldview to, to say it forward, be generous and, you know, kind of try to put out more than you take in. And so I'm always encouraging professionals, accomplished people of, of every field to how can they pay it forward? Right. You know, it's all of us, if, if we're at some peak of success, a lot of folks who helped us along the way. So how can you volunteer, teach, donate things, or just share your own learning process? Um, you know, you can touch lives that people you might not even meet. <laughs> it could be all over the world. Right. And like Zeldman's blog did for me. You would never anticipate that a kid in Houston would read this, you know, big shot designer in New York. And, and that would sort of set me down a path to be where WordPress got created. So yeah, I would say that anyone listening to this, if you're listening to this, you're probably <laughs> ahead of 99.9% of the world in terms of your particular skill set. So if you can share that as much as right. possible, it's really powerful. And so also thank you for doing things like this podcast. I feel like that's uh, it's part of it. Oh, but no, th- thank you for setting the example as well. I mean, you know, it's interesting when we, we talk about the ways in which we can reach beyond where we are. And today's world has put a challenge on that notion of proximity, that our world and our learning and the way we work has to be limited to where we are. So, you know, before we talk a bit about the future of work, I'd love to ask you these questions really simply. Where do you feel most productive? I'm a big believer in investing in your environment. Okay. Whether that's your mobile environment or your kind of debt. And so I try to have, when I'm at home, I try to have objects on the desk that inspire me. I try to have books nearby that I can pick up and flip through reminders of right. leaders or designers or artists that I find exciting. Art is really key to me. Lighting. <laughs> I try to have candles so there's nice smells. And then, you know, also investing in the tools and, you know, great keyboard, great mouse, great monitor, like all these sorts of things. I do the arm now where the monitor's on one of these, like, articulating arm so I can oh, nice. move it around and have a lot of desk space. So I'm a huge believer in that. And I guess it goes through to our company as well. Like we, we provide new laptops to people every 18 months, not because the old laptops break down, but just we want people to have the very best tools of their trade. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, when I'm on the road, what I try to think about is focus and how do I remove distractions? Okay. And for me, the best way to do that is just actually headphones and music. I find that even if you can't control the environment, the right music can really get you in a flow state. And sometimes I'll even listen to the same song or same album on repeat for hours and hours. And for me, my biggest battle is just battling distraction. And I actually feel like it's gotten harder right. over the past five years than it's ever been. And so I'm always looking for ways to essentially trick the distractible part of my mind. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Falling prey to that notification or that right. that uh, draw out of the focus or flow state because it's so easy, particularly as an executive, you know, with now 2000 colleagues to look at Slack or I can make myself very busy and not get the most important things on my list done right. every day. But I worked all day and I get positive reinforcement for responding right. to all the people that contacted me quickly and everything. So it's really about just trying to make that time for the, the deep work. Which I had a, so a conversation just recently with a colleague and I talked about moving away from a checklist to moving towards an impact list. 
Hmm. and saying there are always things that I have on the checklist that I can do and I can check them off and I can feel good about that action. But they may not contribute to the impact that I'm trying to have. And kind of playing around with that, you know, it's it's very easy, especially in the marketing side. It's like, I've done all these things. But have I really kind of done the the work or the items that move me towards the impact? And kind of giving that a refreshing that you may have 20 items on a checklist but you only have three on an impact. Yeah. So it's in a continuum of that question. And you started going down that path. Where do you feel the most creative? Hmm. And playing that they don't have one in the same. Yeah. Yeah. Any sort of art. So I get really inspired in museums. If I ever go to the opera, I take a notebook. (laughs) I get tons of ideas. So just trying to, I get probably the most inspiration and in creative from like the, the juxtaposition of differing fields. Right. And so I love seeing artists that do that kind of combine things I didn't expect. And I just find my own mind turns over problems in a different way when I'm engaged with a live performance or a museum or just something that, that kind of feeds the soul a bit. I, I love the, the conversation and the juxtaposition. I remember the first time I heard. Yo-Yo Ma's project and experiment with the Silk Road who brought in all of these different musicians in ways that you didn't imagine. And one of the musicians played a kind of ancient flute. The other yeah. played some string instrument. I don't remember that. I've never seen before. I played a bagpipe as well. Yeah. And the third artist was this incredible human beatbox. Huh. So in this moment, I'm sitting there and, and completely blown away about this musical juxtaposition. And they went on a tour of, of the history of global music. And with those three instruments, hmm. which is kind of incredible in that space. So when, you know, we talk about where we feel most productive and where we feel most creative. And at the heart of that is kind of our thoughts about how we work. And I know the New York Times noted you as really the champion and patron saint in some ways of mobile working, thinking of working differently outside of the back of working from home. I love when you write up the distinction between remote work and distributed work. Hmm. Could you talk a bit about that and your viewpoint? Because you've really been on the kind of leading edge of thinking about working from anywhere to create impact. Sure. Yeah, the, the distinction for between remote and distributed comes for me for two places. One, my engineering background, right, <laughs> so right. like a lot of study of distributed systems and how to make them resilient. But two, just the importance of words, which I think are, you know, words create reality. And if um, even the word remote and distributed, like if you're remote, it implies that there's something central that you're far away from. And work is so much about connection. You want to be close to your colleagues. You want to be connected. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be remote from them. Right. So. Right. Yeah, I don't feel like I would wake up in the morning and say, like, I want to be remote <laughs> from my work or my colleagues. Right. Or, it's, it seems like a punishment, right? <laughs> yeah, like that literally is how we punish people with solitary confinement and things like right. that. So, yeah, let's not do that. Let's do the opposite. Let's be super connected, but distributed. And I think it also, it's built an organization in a way where every node on the network, every person, right. every part of it has an equal opportunity to contribute and to connect to all the other nodes. So to me, distributed is a great word for that. It also, you know, I, my podcast is called distributed. Everything's right. called distributed. And I've seen it adopted more and more. It is a longer word, has more syllables. But I think that if organizations can consciously use it, it also right. will help them adopt the organizational structures, the communication styles, everything else, which they'll be more successful with in the long run. It, it's really clear in, in even in how you've grown your organization that it was intentional from the beginning, right? That this is how you structure to move forward. What advice do you have for organizations who have, you know, weathered the last 24 months and some, not by choice, but more by force, have moved into this space, but they realize that this is the future. What advice do you have for those organizations? Well, the first thing I recognize is that every person in every organization is really different. Right. So my best advice would just be to keep experimenting. Like we had this forced, <laughs> unplanned experiment. No one asked for, but right. gosh, how much have we learned from it? And so whatever it is that you're doing that feels like 
the way things have to be or the way you have to work and it's impossible to imagine the opposite, see if you can engineer a month where you do the opposite. Okay. And for us, that also means we're thinking a lot about how to get together in person right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and hoping that, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're planning a lot of meetups and a lot of people are getting together and wondering if there's going to be a commercial real estate crash, which means we can, you know, get more collaboration spaces around the planet or something. And so it's really just kind of looking at what is the opposite of what you've been doing and take for granted and trying it out and then learning from what that opposite, the, the sort of reasoning via negativa, negativa, it like can learn, can teach you. So have you seen a boon in the way in which your teams are able to work with each other in the last, you know, 24 months or have you seen that? Cause you, yeah. you were, because you were well equipped before this moment, right? So everyone was already, they had the right equipment, they had the right tools, they had the cultural yeah. meaning. You know, I will say that since the company started, it's gotten so much easier okay. <laughs> to be a distributed company. I mean, we used to do no video meetings because all the tools were so bad. Right. So really prior to Zoom, we just didn't even bother because they were so bad. I mean, we started the company using IRC, which is like text chat. Okay. AOL Instant Messenger, some Skype. Like, it was really kind of cobbled you, you together. You kind of hobbled together here, right? Yeah, we didn't have P2, our internal blogging system. Email was really bad. Like everything was pretty rough. And what's been cool to me about the pandemic is how even the big tech companies have really prioritized things like investing in better webcams and better right. microphones for the computers. All the video tools, whether it's Meet or Hangouts or whatever it is, like Zoom has gotten a lot better. Teams, they're all pretty decent right now. So I love that it's kind of reshaped all right. the technology companies' roadmaps because it did really feel like they were ignoring this entire space of like people, you know, communicating via cameras and microphones with their colleagues. All right. What, what do you think is next and kind of a near next as we look in 22 and 23? What do you think? Yeah, I actually think in that hardware side of things, we are entering a very exciting time because all the companies are really working on it quite well. And we've gone to the point where a setup that used to cost thousands of dollars, you can now get through right. a new MacBook, which has incredible stereo microphones that eliminate background noise. And portrait mode is now built into the cameras on phones and everything. So that to me has been kind of amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing that trend continue. I think the other thing that pretty excited about being next is just people who've gone from working all in the same place right to working the same way but being in different places are starting to adopt more asynchronous work which okay. i would call right. embracing the constraints and the benefits of the medium of distributed right. work to unlock a lot of flexibility and and efficiency from how we work together so and that's, I think, the next big trend is people working in a more asynchronous fashion. So in that question, how does that shape your leadership as a leader? As you start to see people adopt that approach, how does it change the way you lead? I think not just myself, but all managers and leaders, um, particularly in, in sort of the tech industry, need to relearn how they do things. It's like learning to play a new instrument. Right. I don't actually think distributed work is fully better or worse than all right. everyone in office every day, everything that it's just really different. So what worked for you when your team was all, you know, within 30 feet of each other, it's going to be different from when your team is not even within 30 miles of each other. And then when they all start working on different time zones or even globally, you just have to learn new ways of communication, of connecting with people, of getting folks aligned, of driving urgency and speed. It's just like learning a new instrument. <laughs> You know, so saxophone is not better than flute or piano. They're just different. <laughs> you, so you you sure, you sure saxophone's not better? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's also scary because yeah. if, if you've been successful in your career, especially for 10, 20, 30 years, you're probably really comfortable with your way of doing things and right. learning that new thing. You're going to be bad for a while and it's going to suck. It's like learning a new sport, learning to ski right. when you snowboard it or something. And so just embracing that, embracing the discomfort and finding that beginner's mind is just really key. I, and we've all been forced to do it for a while now. Right. It's probably going to be some version of this for a long time to come, if not just because people have gotten used to it. But yeah, that's the what I would advise. I, I think that's really powerful and wonderful advice as we think about it, kind of leaning into 
the the discomfort of the way in which we approach the world. You know, we I asked a little bit before about what role do you think designers can play? I'm going to come back to that again. As we think about this, what role do you think those who are skilled in design, you know, whether it's 2D, 3D, experiential experience, those who are skilled in design, what do you think they can offer to helping us shape this new world of work? Skilled in design, shaping the new world of work. It's hard to answer that only because I feel like design benefits everything it touches. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know if it's specific to the new world of work, but I'm excited about, as I mentioned, this the sort of user base, like yeah. the daily users of all these tools right. going up exponentially and likely going to increase a lot more. Companies investing more in the tools, uh, both software and hardware. That just creates a lot of market-driven forces to right. get, you know, now there's not just zero <laughs> good video conferencing. There's now like five really good ones. And then there's companies, get what it's called, like Loom or Loon or Around or something like that are actually innovating on that model. Where we're not just, you know, Brady Bunch boxes <laughs> all talking to each other, but maybe there's something a lot more dynamic. Maybe it's easy to throw up a virtual whiteboard or I I don't love using this term because there's so much hype around it, but right. I'm not a big believer in the metaverse. Okay. But I am a huge believer in augmented reality. And talk a bit I more about that. that. Right. We well, it's actually possible for a meeting where everyone's on Zoom to be way better than when we're in person. Right. And it's kind of hard to think about that because I love seeing people as well. Like I, I, I do get a lot of energy from being in a room with folks. But when you think of what's enabled, like for example, everyone's the same height on, okay. on, on, on Zoom. Right. And so it's not like you're naturally, you know, we have these natural built-in biases to like maybe listen to taller people more or pay more attention to them. Everyone can be the same volume. You know, things like I, I just coughed. I was able to mute <laughs> and I'm not coughing on people. So that's right. really nice. That's like uh, not interrupting the audio flow of what's happening. I have colleagues who are like, you know, use Snapchat filters and they're like, I don't have to put up makeup, put on makeup in the morning. Okay. I just put on a filter on my camera <laughs> and it does the equivalent. So this is, these are ways of augmenting reality that I, I think love that you, exciting. I'd love that you just made the case for why Zoom is better. <laughs> For our world. <laughs> I, I, I love that in that space. So right, uh, augmented reality, I, I think as well about the ability to quickly tie in items, like how many times I've been on a Zoom call where something comes up flow of consciousness and we can pull the image, we can pull the video, we can drop things in in a way. Yeah. It's a really good, especially for designers, how often you screen share and how fast you can screen share is a great indicator of how fluent you are at the tools. Right. right. And compare that to remember trying to like plug into the TV in a oh, conference room. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're looking for the dongle or you're trying to like put in the code to airplay. It, it was always a mess. And the wow. Academy Award would always go to your colleague for pretending they could use the system, but not. <laughs> like, yeah. The moment. You're right. Yeah. When you get good at that online, it's amazing. And everyone can. By the way, I actually like that you can look things up during a meeting. And or that you can mute or go off, that you can a uh, screen share really quickly, like, and that we can all maybe put the same notes on our screen and be like taking notes simultaneously. It, like these are ways that we can augment the the reality of our meeting experience to make it more effective. And, and I, I would say, really yeah, and I would say you win anyway for being the first time I've heard somebody say dongle in twenty four months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily we haven't thought about those. We haven't thought about that, but no, I, I think you're. I think you're right. So as we move for this kind of promise of augmented reality or an extension of our space in here, what do you feel is next around the corner? So we talk about kind of the meeting interface. Where are some other potential possibilities for, for augmented reality for us? I don't know if I call it augmented reality, but so for our company, Automatic, okay. the biggest thing that being truly distributed is unlocked is... Um, Around talent, okay. You know, right. I would say both on the hiring side and on the retention side. So, one being able to tap into the global talent pool. There's, you know, talent is equally distributed. Opportunity is not right. right? It doesn't matter where you happen to be born, where you won the Avarian lottery. Now, with pretty modest tools and computers, you're on the internet and you can be part of a, you know, a company like Automatic that's, right. you know, changing the internet and building things and all this sort of stuff. And we pay the same ranges regardless of geography. 
So if you're doing the same work, you get the same pay. It doesn't matter to me where nice. you're from, where you live, where you wake up and go to sleep every night. Like that's all, it, it's all about the work. And so that has allowed us, I think, to just give people opportunities and find talent that's not, that's everywhere. And then two, I think the, the sort of autonomy and agency that distributed work gives people, gives them a lot of control over their day, their environment, how they build their work day, and the ability to contribute to something meaningful means our retention rates are, or sorry, I should reverse that. Our attrition rates are one quarter to one fifth other companies in our field. So that I just think makes for a really great culture over time. So one that you're able to bring in a true diversity of people, not just from different places, but actually living in different places. And they're working alongside each other in a in an equal fashion because we all have the equal opportunity to contribute by working online. And then them staying longer. Right. <laughs> so being that like that institutional knowledge, everything that that builds up when you get longer tenured folks is really powerful. And I now have, you know, a good chunk of colleagues I've been working with for 15 years now. I was going to ask you about that. Wow. How, how long Ten years now so, with the teams, right? Yeah, it's just a level of communication and trust and everything when you're able to build that you know, professional relationship over that amount of time is something I really, really cherish. And the only downside, because people always ask me the downside, is honestly, I just miss them. <laughs> I okay. wish I could see them a lot more. And even pre-COVID, you know, we could only really see each other a few times a year logistically. But that's the one thing. I really love the people I work with, and I do wish I could spend more time with them. I, I love your, your quote in the Inc. article that you had recently that you said something really interesting about working outside of the office, and it's, it falls in line with what we're talking about here, that it had, quoting you here, an incredible impact on the individuals and ultimately empowers them to lead richer lives. It leads them to be able to bring more creativity to their work and their lives. Hmm. It's kind of a, kind of a powerful statement as, as a leader to kind of understand that those actions actually show up in people's lives in different and meaningful ways. And so I think it's a testament, especially if you talk about having such long tenure in a space that tends to be more disruptively dynamic, right? Yeah. And, you know, automatic's not for everyone either. Right. So people might leave in their first year, but that's great <laughs> because the folks who stick around tend to stick around longer and longer. I do truly believe that if folks are more balanced in the rest of their life, mm -hmm. they're also going to be more creative at work. And so to the extent a company can provide an environment for them to create that balance, we can't do it for them. Right? Right. <laughs> like Ultimately, people are their own boss of their lives. But if you can sort of create an environment that lends itself towards giving people some more agency and control, I think it enables those, uh, it just unlocks a lot of time, if nothing else. You know, think of the time saved on commuting. Right. Think of the time saved on travel. Think of the time, like all these other things that, you know, were necessary in a pre-internet age. Right. But we kind of kept doing them 20 or 30 years longer after we needed to. Yeah, so true. So... I'm going to get personal and ask you about balance. So, you know, we both are pre pandemic we're on the planes every day mm -hmm. and back and forth and moving around. Tell me about the role of photography has played in your life. Mm -hmm. Photography was how I got started publishing on the web. Okay. I, I sort of got started building websites for myself as a way to share my photos. Oh, wow. It was also definitely something where digital photography, because I kind of started in the digital age, right. I got a digital camera early on, uh, was very freeing because just this idea that something went from scarce, you know, you had to pay right. money, to develop every photo to abundant where, you know, I could essentially take unlimited pictures, it allowed me to take those tens of thousands of bad photos. Right. <laughs> that led to starting to take a few good ones to get to your mastery. Right. The other thing is, I think it also, the the camera was like very much a security blanket for me. Okay. As uh, like a naturally shy person, but really wanting to connect with people. When I would go into events or something like that, I would always have the camera. And it became something I could, one, create a little bit of distance between me and the rest of folks. You know, the camera it can be a little bit of a wall, but then also a connection, you know, and like capturing a fun photo of someone and sharing them afterwards or sending it to people. 
it always gave me something to do, something to talk about, like a little totem right. that broke the ice with, with all the people there. So I was just kind of a shy kid and probably still a shy adult in some ways. It was, it's a nice uh, icebreaker. So yeah, it's big influence on my life. That's why my username is Photomat everywhere. Right. I tell on Twitter, it's still Photomat. I publish fewer photos than I used to, but it's a big, actually one of the resolutions I have this year is to get back to that that at that publishing and honestly not just trying to post the good ones like just posting them just right. to post them i, 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 think I, that's really I knew great. from our conversation before that you love that you love photography but <laughs> it's interesting to hear how that loops back in and reinforces so here's the, the personal question what was the last photo you took oh last photo i took well I, i'll do this short and the, the easy answer which is i've been taking photos on my phone constantly now right. so okay. i use it as a way to do memory so the last actual last one I took, let's see, was of, oh, I went for a run the other day with a couple of friends. Okay. <laughs> so I, th I took the picture of us about to do the run because I'm training up for a half marathon. But the last like serious photo I took with the real camera was I, I did a trip to Antarctica. Oh, wow. I actually planned in 2014 because oh, wow. a few months ago, there was a total solar eclipse over a penguin colony and the middle of Antarctica. So yeah, for seven years, I planned this trip and finally got to go on it. Wow. And it was really exciting. I was able to take the DJI Mavic 3, the drone, which is an incredible unlock as a photographer or videographer to have a drone. And, and I was shooting with a Nikon camera, which was really fun. Okay. So you're going to share this photo with me, right? Uh, I, well, I took a lot of photos. <laughs> of it. I'm in the winnowing down process right now. I'm definitely like, uh, that, that is, I would say my biggest thing I need to work on is like getting a faster workflow for okay. going from, you know, a thousand photos to a hundred. I was actually really inspired. There's, there was a couple of professional photographers on the trip, including a really awesome sports photographer from, um, Norway. Okay. And um, his workflow is literally taking, I think he shot like 30,000 photos on the trip wow. where I shot a thousand. I thought that was a lot, but I was really inspired by how he was able to really go through them quite quickly and window it down from like 30,000 to 3,000 and then 3,000 to 1,000 and 1,000 to 500. And he, he just would kind of loop through them. And mm -hmm. I mean, he, he put some serious hours in it and he's definitely done this his whole career, but it inspired me to be like, Hey, I, I need to stop making excuses for like getting through just a thousand. We have a thousand to go into. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting. So you talk about kind of collections and how these things work together and parsing your way through. I think it's also a metaphor for you in thinking about your companies, plural, and like how they kind of all work together. What has been your process of, of getting that synergy between the companies you've created and those you've added in? I'm thinking in particular, most recently Tumblr. Like, how do you think about that as a, as kind of an exercise? You know, I wish I could say we had some brilliant, you know, secret whiteboard where we mapped it all out. But it really just comes from listening okay. to yeah. our users and customers. And so, you know, 2013, 2014, a lot of folks using WordPress were saying they wanted to do e-commerce. And so we we're like, okay, yeah, okay, let's go check out e-commerce stuff. And that led to our acquisition of WooCommerce, which now seven years later is doing 31 billion of, of sales. Wow. You know, <laughs> things being built through WooCommerce. It's probably going to be bigger than the rest of our company combined in the next year or two. And that was really customer driven. So I'm just a hugest believer of, you know, I love it. I think they called it getting out of the building or whatever it was, but just going and listening to folks, uh, doing some client meetings, like tagging along. I do customer support. The whole company does it at least once a year. And I try to dip in, you know, every month or so just, you know, as it's like a secret shopper <laughs> or, yeah. or secret boss or whatever it's called, like going in there, just answering whoever randomly comes in. What's um, been the, the most refreshing surprise you've had doing that experience? I, I likewise, I love it being able to come in and actually engage in all different levels with your customers. Stay called. Yeah. What, what recently? Also, it's better it's, online. Like, yeah. honestly, when I show up to a client meeting, just who I am changes it. And right, so I'm not right. getting like a really perfect representation of what it's like to talk to a potential advertiser for Tumblr or something. But doing customer support, I'm just a chat bot, right? Like no one knows me from Adam, which is really great. The biggest surprise is the ones that still happen and they drive me crazy, but right. I appreciate it. It's just finding something really simple that's broken right. in a place we haven't looked at in a really long time. Wow. 
And it's kind of like, wow, we've got, you know, 200 people working on different things for WordPress.com. But there's this one part of the sign up that's broken that no one's thought about. No one's ever thought about. And fixing it's not even that hard. It might be one or two engineers that need to work on it. But it just kind of, we just, the other ways we're doing research and design and other things just didn't show this one thing. And the other thing that also gives me a lot of energy from it, we alluded to it earlier, just being inspired by how people are using the tools. Right. Like ultimately, kind of what our company does is we make paintbrushes and canvases. Right. <laughs> and, and really what it's all about is what people create on top of it. And so I just love seeing, you know, ways that people are using WordPress and day one and pocket cast and all of our tools to like create something I wouldn't imagine. So you often describe yourself still, and I did when we started our conversation as a blogger. For all the other things, CEO, engineer, entrepreneur, uh, jazz saxophonist, you still always come back to considering yourself a blogger. Do you, you feel that, that, does it feel really true and authentic for you to think of yourself as a blogger? It feels like that's where you, you naturally center. You come back to that. Yeah. And honestly, when I think back to it, the most impactful, some of the most impactful things I've ever done, both inside the company and just on the internet have been sitting down at a keyboard <laughs> and getting something out of my head and into the world through publishing. And sometimes that's been code. And, right. but more often than not, it's actually been words and prose. And, you know, those words and prose can sometimes inspire someone new to contribute or inspire someone to join the company. Or, and, uh, you know, I'll do lots of things like this because I love reaching new audiences and sort of evangelizing open source and distributed work and, inviting people to work for automatic if, if what we talked about jazzed them. Right. But the written word is resonates and has ripples in a way that even the be biggest podcasts don't. Right. Because you know? it could be someone searching for something on Google and they come across something wrote eight years ago and that leads them down a rabbit hole. So this just becomes one of these ways that you, I think, find your drive. Like all humans are looking for connection. To me, the coolest thing about the internet is that whatever you're into, there's other people that are into that and you can start to just by sort of like finding your way online, searching for things, finding communities, finding great publishers. And then what they share, you can really find like the 50 or a hundred people that are into exactly the things you are and just as passionate about quilting Elvis quilts or whatever it is, or some subgenre of music or whatever you're into, you can find a tribe. And I think that's really powerful. So. It's hard to believe we, we've come to the end of our, our time, but I have this one question for you to encourage those listening. How would you encourage people to shape their impact set? How would you encourage people to find the way that, that they drive impact? Hmm. I find it really helpful for myself to zoom out. Okay. And well, I'll just tell you something I do. I keep a goals file every okay. year. I have it going back to probably 2007. And the files both where like at the beginning of the year, I'll write my goals, like right, right. New resolutions or things like that. But I actually use it to record the year as it goes. Okay. And so I basically have engineered hacks to like get myself opening this file regularly. Okay. So if I watch a movie, I'll put it in the file. If I read a book, I put it in the file. And I try to put significant events in there, like big life events, things I want to look back on in the coming years and remember. Like, oh, that's when my sister bought the house or that's yes. when my godchildren was born on right. this day or something like that. So I can look back at like my goals dash 2014 file and kind of like relive the year a little bit. And that also gets me then reminded of the things I wrote. <laughs> so by reopening that file regularly, I, you know, I can't help but sometimes glance over and be reminded of these bigger goals. So, and then I modify them over okay. the year. And I'll change it. So to me, it's not like written in stone, but it's meant to be a really dynamic document that, uh, that really evolves over the year. And I'll put personal goals. I'll put business goals, financial goals, just kind of everything. It's a real mix max. And it's just unstructured. I do it in simple notes. So it's just okay. an unstructured, it's unstructured kind of text file. But that is just the perfect kind of amount. It's the perfect thing for me to return to. And that reminds me of like, you know, in my more contemplative moments or right. when I'm you know, talking with friends and asking them what they think I should do or what I need to focus on or what I need to work on. I can be reminded of that kind of 
perspective, which is outside of the day to day. Because more than ever, like I mentioned before, it's very easy for me to lo- be lost in day to day work. Right. And lose sight of the bigger things. So I really need reminders like that. And that text file, that yearly text file has been really helpful for me. Wow. That's a great way to close out our, our conversation today with innovator, engineer, coder, blogger, and really kind of authentic leader here. I, one of the things that I appreciate, Matt, when we talk is just the time that you take to reflect on where you are in the world around you and how that impacts those. I thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing with our design adjacent audience. Thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to connect again in the future. And thank you also for all the work AIG IA does. Like it's a very powerful organization. Well, thank you, good sir. And we will catch up in person in the near future. We'll see you all. <laughs> so thank you all for joining this episode of Design Adjacent. We invite you back. We'll, next time, we'll continue our conversations on looking at design and its impact on the world around us, both today and into tomorrow. Thank you. Show notes for this episode will be available on AIGA.org. Please subscribe to our show on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. AIGA's Design Adjacent Podcasts and its contents are the copyright of AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. All rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the contents in any form is prohibited without AIGA's express written permission. My name is Li Shan Huang. Until next time.